Yeah, good afternoon. Um, welcome to our session, our panel session here. Um, recruiting overlooked open source contributors and building open source software partnerships with community colleges. Um, so welcome, really, really glad you could join us this afternoon. Um, let me dive in and share a little bit of background. Uh, my name is Ken and I teach at a community college here in Washington State. Um, so some facts you may or may not know, um, actually one third of all US college students in the United States are at community colleges. So um, 24 states um, in the US now authorize their community colleges to offer four year degrees as well. So this is a fairly recent development over the last decade. Um, and the majority of CS degrees that are conferred in the US are offered from non-PhD granting institutions. Um, we consider this as one of the last places you can access uh, an undergraduate degree um, for less than $10,000 a year. So given a, a little bit of its background, you know, we're trying to find this connection between the students who we serve in these community colleges and the open source um, community and the opportunities that are there. So just some fast facts. I know there's a little eye chart here, but you know, it is a different, um, sl slightly different audience that we're serving at community colleges. As you see here, the average age of the community college students is 26. So they come with life experience, lived experiences, um, and they're bringing something different and unique and special. And you'll get to see a little bit of that in our panel here um, with a mentor and mentee um, kind of sharing their experiences. So, yep. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, our students, like we said, is majority overlooked and underserved and they're non-traditional. They've had a lot of jobs previously, whether it's their veterans or uh, you know, they work, might have worked in retail or food service or something else. So they, they all have a really interesting work background. And, uh, the, uh, and because of their previous experience, it takes a little bit of help to help them understand how the tech ecosystem is hiring, which is very different than the ones I just mentioned. Um, and how do you navigate it and kind of go through this funnel of how tech does hiring? I think a majority of our students didn't even know what that funnel looked like. Uh, and so uh, that's something we wanna really uh, help our students from being tech outsiders to transitioning them to tech insiders from students to professionals. And this is one of our students from Green River. You know, because it was the recession. My mom was really poor. She was a janitor. So what we did was like we had our mom just like move in with her boyfriend, and then me and my brother moved out on our own with her friend. As a freight company, it was bad. It was very bad. I was an administrative assistant, so I kind of did like a lot of everything. And the environment, it was not like very controlled. Um, so yeah, there was like a lot of sexual harassment, a lot of um, weird stuff. I think the straw that was like the last time was like a sexual harassment thing that would happen to me and my coworker all the time. So I was like, this cannot happen. It was like kind of the final straw and it just left. That's kind of why I went back to school, taking a Python class and I was like, this is where I want to go. It's just really fun. <laughs> it was very interesting taking Java and then Java 2 and stuff like that to kind of like solidified it. Like the more you learn the more you understand like the more fun it becomes yeah it's kind of brought a lot of confidence you know because it was the recession my mom so what we try to do is try to create a win-win uh, win -win situation to uh for the students at open source uh we try to uh help the students with a wraparound set of services and support to help them to, to, to transition. One is having a two-year two mentor, career mentoring. Uh, we match students with two industry mentors and they be once a month uh, throughout the school year and talk about you know all the things we just talked about on how to enter tech. And then uh, in their junior year, they do a uh, open source capstone with uh, our partner here, Code Day, to make their first uh, 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 contribution to open source uh, in, in about a month. And then senior year, we work with the, uh, with the schools to embed a quarter law open source uh, uh, project. 
Yeah, and I, I think the main things to take away from this are like it, it's kind of a process. There's a lot of skills you need to learn to be able to contribute to open source. It's the social skills. It's the how do you even do something when you don't know the answer and your professor doesn't know the answer? Like how do how do you even function in that situation? You know, you haven't studied it before. And then you know, finally, like going on to make really big contributions to to projects that you know actually affect tens of thousands of users. It's a whole journey that that people go on. Yeah, and it's about building software in real life that's outside of the classroom. And so one of the three things we learned that students don't know when they started and they actually thought like our program wasn't going according to plan are the three things we actually want them to learn and help them understand that's how actual software is built. So the students have a totally different conception of how software is built. Number one is like this is really complex, right? It's a huge, huge code base, and they're making a small contribution to a huge, huge code base, which is very different than if you're in class and you're kind of building a project all on your own and how to deal with that. And, um, and what they're looking at is really, really so much API, so much other people's code, and it's very, very different than them writing their own code. Uh, and then also just like how do you, when you're writing software by yourself, it's one thing, but when you do it in a team, how do you manage the team? How do you manage relationship with others? So there's a lot of these like three things that doing an open source contribution really help the students understand it by doing that firsthand. Yeah, and just to give you an example of this sort of thing that we're talking about, like a lot of students, for example, their first contribution might be a couple lines of code and they feel awful because they spent like a week or two you know, just to write these three lines of code. And in reality, like, you know, figuring out what code to write is often 90% of the problem, but that's not something you've seen in school and things like that. So just helping people learn those sort of, um, that basically how the industry actually works in practice. Open source is a great opportunity for them to do it. Going through their first code review, right? That is serious, serious stuff. And then, uh, and then like failing half of the automated tests that other people have built. Because otherwise, in a project, they build their own tests and they always pass, right, magically. But in real life, that doesn't happen. And also, finally, you know, that, that big win they feel when they actually check it in and, and, and have people use it. Yeah, and by the way, all this thing, you know, you're getting feedback on your, uh, your code review. And uh, in the classroom environment, if you're getting negative feedback on the code you've written, that's probably a really bad thing. Um, in open source, it's completely normal, and so it's just it's super scary, I think, for a lot of these folks to do it, and that's why you know we've tried to build up programs to support them. And it's also coming from real engineers versus your professors who are not real people, right? That's the other <laughs> thing. Just even it may be the same message, but it's coming from someone else who's in industry or you know working on Flutter or something like that. It carries a slightly different weight, and and it's like a different message to the students, or the students absorbs the message a little bit different. Yeah, so we've been doing this for a while. You can read this ads. So we we uh, work with a lot of students. Uh, you know, some of the projects you probably used, uh, like GitHub CLI, uh, Dash Browse, uh, some of the flow, like a lot, a lot of projects. And uh, a lot of our students have now uh, uh, accepted jobs in industry, and some of them have, uh, you know, this is our fourth year, so some of them have come back as mentors in the program. So we're super happy, excited. Uh, to, to, to have them. Um, and uh, yeah, 40% of the students continue to contribute after the project is, the school project portion is over. And uh, yeah, we're published, so we're not just making stuff up. So that's always good. Yeah, I think a, a lot of the maintainers, um, many people are great and supportive. Uh, don't get me wrong, but I've, I've talked to many maintainers who are sort of thinking that this is, you know, the, these aren't students who can really do anything real, right? These are students who are like at these colleges that you haven't even heard of. These aren't MIT or Stanford or anything like that. And like, they're new to this and like, what can they really do? And the, the reality is quite a lot. I mean, we've had, as Kevin said, like students have made contributions to uh, GitHub tools that you've probably used. We have, have had students who've made contributions to the core Python project. Um, we've had, I think uh, for Code Day, we've had over a thousand students uh, pull requests landed in open source projects that affect tens of thousands to tens of millions of users. So yeah, I mean, students can absolutely do something real when they have the right guidance and, and mentorship. And yes, these aren't schools that you've heard of before, but that, that doesn't mean that there's anything different about the students there other than that the schools are a little bit more affordable. So 
it really takes everybody in the community to make this happen. Uh, and, and we're really thankful for the mentors that we have had. And, uh, you know, we get support from the, the state board, the National Science Foundation, uh, uh, Strata Education Foundation. You know, you saw some of our students, the Linux Foundation worked with us to make that happen. A whole year's worth, worth, worth of planning for a day for the students. So it's been uh, really great. If, if you don't know what Kevin's talking about, by the way, that we brought 60 students yesterday. Um, you, you may have talked to some of them if you saw anyone with a name tag that said Green River. Cool. So I'd like to turn it over a little bit to Marianne and Kat to talk a little bit about the experience of being a mentor and a, a student in this process. Great. Yeah. Do you all want to take a second to introduce yourselves? Sure. Um, hi, my name is Marianne Golden. Um, I'm a, a systems engineer. I'm a backend engineer, uh, primarily working in Rust. Um, I'm also active in the Rust community, and I've been a mentor with Mentors in Tech going on about three years and Code Day two years. Um, I had the pleasure of working with Kat uh, the last two years. So my name is Katherine Watkins. Um, I'm a software engineer at Costco as of this week. I'm also a uh, <laughs> thank you. I'm also a student of Green River College uh, for the Software Development Bachelor's Program and also a mentee in Mint. Um, and like Marianne said, I worked with her on Occam, which is an open source Rust library last year, and um, it really opened up a lot of doors for me. So what were you before? So prior to going to school for software development, I was a nursing assistant at Seattle Children's for about 16 years. Um, so I'm a little bit late in going to school. Um, I have four kids and I got divorced. And so I kind of needed a new career to help support me and my children. And that's why I chose uh, software engineering. And I will bet there's not a single student at MIT or UW that has 15 years as a nurse and has four kids, guaranteed. <laughs> yeah. So maybe first question I have is for Kat here. Um, what? Um, and you shared a little bit of your story, so thank you for that. Um, when you came to college, did you know anyone in tech or how to access opportunities or a career in tech? So my brother's a software engineer, but I I think a big part of it is I didn't know what questions to ask. Um, so I came in pretty much not knowing anything. Um, what I really like about the program that I'm in with Mint is that they kind of help guide you in asking the questions that you need to ask to know where to start in tech. Great. And then one more for Kat here, and then we'll switch over to Marianne. Um, what um, what do you, would you say you know, uh, helped you be successful in this open source project? Would you have been able to do this on your own? If, if I, in my classroom, asked you, hey, go find an open source project and, and, and make a contribution, would you have been able to do it on your own, you think? I think even just finding an open source project to um, contribute to is a little overwhelming. Um, and then the issue that I worked on was like a CI/CD um, problem, and I had I didn't even know what a CI/CD pipeline was when I started. So having mentors that I could you know look to for guidance and like where to find the answer to the problem that I'm working on um, was really helpful for me. Great. And let me go to Marianne um, as a mentor. Um, you know in the you mentioned you use code as a teacher. Can you speak a little bit about how you do that? <laughs> yeah, so there's a book I really like called Apprenticeship Patterns, which is a, a bit of like tips and tricks, tricks for how to learn. And uh, one of the patterns is uh, sources teacher. So it's about learning how to read source code um, and kind of a self-education through reading source code. So um, something I do enjoy doing with folks is just like going through code together, um, talking through it, um, trying to get better at not giving all the answers away, but um, trying to use the code to onboard ourselves without necessarily uh, feeling like we have to know everything already about all the frameworks, all the architectures and everything. Um, and I think also um, helping the students to feel enfranchised, to go and dig, dig through the source code and try to come up with their own hypotheses, um, rather than, okay, we're just going to dive in into implementation, which means all these things have to you know, be set. Um, I think this is a little bit more um, of a sustainable way to learn, and also one that I found like pays dividends for me professionally because uh, I end up actually learning a lot more from spelunking in the source 
uh, rather than just you know completely just trusting everything that's in the docs. I do have a follow-on question for Marianne here. Uh, I know you work a full-time job <laughs> in the day, and you you do open source contribution on your own time, kind of beyond that. What kind of benefits have you found uh, in investing this time as a mentor for yourself and in your career? Um, it's it's been really huge for me, actually. Like I've really found a voice, um, a leadership voice for myself. I mean, there is a bit of responsibility with having a team of students for a whole quarter. Um, and some of the work I've done with mentors in tech has been around Rust, which is, you know, emerging and um, creating a curriculum or like boundarying a curriculum for Rust is challenging. And so it's really helped me to kind of step into a space that I was intimidated by um, and to take some risks and to also have ownership of it. So I, that's really translated in my in my day job. Um, and I think the second thing is just uh, teaching makes a person have to learn the thing three times as hard. So uh, I definitely, there's some things about Rust that I never thought I would know quite as well as I do. And then when I you know, have to talk about ba backing up my reasons at work, uh, I always kind of surprise myself when certain things come out. I'm like, oh yeah, that's right, because I did read that chapter like three or four times. Um, so. It, it does it does force a certain currency influencing and I mean also just the scalability of mentorship is remarkable because if I just do something by myself I just did something by myself but if I you know teaching people to fish but it, it's also about I think um, introducing folks to something that has a bit of like an institutional wrapper and welcoming them to question that wrapper like to question the authority of a github repo and of any kind of command line tool um, and to feel more welcome to like knock knock on it and enter it and you know like participate um, and that's always really rewarding because I know when I started I'm also from I, I have multiple careers and I went back to college and learned programming in community college and it was always really intimidating for me the prospect of getting into anything to do with some someone else's repo. Yeah. So speaking of intimidation, <laughs> this question goes to Kat. Um, you know, how would you kind of you know compare your confidence kind of before embarking on this mentored open source project and after? So for me, I would say before working on the open source project, I'd only worked on like smaller websites um, that were required of us for school, and I'd never really worked in a bigger repo of other people's work and kind of went in and made changes to other people's work. And I felt a little bit um, intimidated, intimidated at first to, you know, make changes on something somebody else has done. But, you know, the reality of working in software is most of the work is going to be working on somebody else's project. So getting that experience early and having um, the just opportunity to work with people that maybe I didn't know gave me a little bit more confidence going into inter internships and interviews um, to say, yeah, I can work as a team even with people I don't know. So, And, and I wonder just as a follow-up thought, if the prospect of like having your name attached to the lines of code, if, if that was something that... That was definitely um, a plus, you know, seeing your name in a repo that, you know, thousands of people look at is exciting um, as a new developer, for sure. Yeah. I think the term blame is unfortunate. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I think maybe that's like one of the little bits of cultural onboarding of, um, yeah, you know, we're all in a race to commit to Maine. And yes, like our name is going to be in the blame line, but it's all good fun because none of us are like perfect and none of these commits are going to be perfect. And that's kind of the whole point of it is we're constantly refining and adding and building. And this is why having a mentor is so important to clear up things like that and, and hold some of these hand a little bit, because if you're going straight in, you just would know. And I think for, for a really long time, you know, I think uh, the open source community have, is trying to figure out how do you reach out to the next generation of maintainers and, and, and have that handoff as, you know, so certain folks retire and so on and so forth. How do you keep open source sustainable for the long time, especially for some very foundational uh, technologies that, you know, our, our world is based upon. And so welcoming these students in with, you know, with, uh, with open arms and spending that time uh, investing in people, because that's what we're doing. 
right? This, this is really just about investing in people and taking your time investing in people and other people's future success is what it's all about. It's, it's you know, could be software, it could be something else, but really down here, it's about investing in other people's, uh, their, and their success. And I think to dovetail from that, um, I recently had an experience of going into a Discord for a new project that we just kicked off with a different uh, team of students and just kind of letting the maintainers know, hey, you know, there's these issues. We're probably going to take, you know, the, a, f a few weeks to work on them. So just hope that's okay. And somebody else just piped in and said, hey, can I join you? And I think sometimes just even having the um, awareness that there is some kind of mentorship happening, whether it's official or unofficial through the community, attracts more people and makes more people more likely to uh, ask the technical question that may lead to an issue or commit. Also, students are really great at identifying problems in your documentation. Um, and uh, we, we've certainly coached a lot of students to make pull requests to fix those too. So it's, it really is kind of a win-win. Maybe one last question before we go to Q&A. And this one's for Marianne. Um, let's see. Um, what would you provide as advice for would-be mentors if anybody in the audience is maybe you know thinking about you know taking on a mentorship role? Um, what would your advice be to them? Hmm, I think uh, thinking about something that you'd like to test as a hypothesis um, and getting a little bit more data and a little bit more structure around it and thinking about what the value could be to someone else to test that hypothesis with you. Um, I think that would be one thing. The other piece I think is just if you would like to see something like invested in, um, it's quite easy really to go and put, put together, you know, like if you have some candidates that want to work on it, um, to put together a group and um, use the, the nature of the unknown as a teaching tool. Like you don't actually have to create any curriculum or structure to mentor an open source like group. Um, part of the mentorship is showing them what you would do if you were entering this question yourself just out of pure curiosity. Um, so how would you onboard yourself to the repo? Uh, how would you connect with the maintainers? How would you figure out who the maintainers are? Um, how would you like even decide that this is a project you wanted to work on? And as you like select an issue, how do you select it? And then, uh, you know, all the things that you would do that may seem like they would just come naturally, all the way down to like a forked repo. Like, what is a forked repo? Having a conversation around that where there's no such thing as a, as a bad question, you know? Like, you would be surprised how much of your innate knowledge you could just kind of talk through and kind of step through with students, and that will be super, like, valuable for them. Yeah, we, we kind of touched on this earlier, actually, but like um, when we were talking about those skills that the students are learning from this, like no one really tells you this explicitly in school, right? Like it, it, you learn a lot of specific skills, but you don't really learn the practice of software engineering until you go out and, and start doing it. And just even seeing people do that is is super valuable in teaching people how to go about the process of how do we narrow down a problem? How do we figure out what the actual problem is? Like, how do we search for solutions for that? How do we test things out and debug things and see, you know, see what's going on and see what works and see what doesn't? All of that is stuff that we all do every single day as engineers, but um, is, you know, is never really conveyed to you explicitly. It's just something you're, you're expected to kind of figure out. And I actually think that one of the advantages of you know, being a student and going and doing open source early on is that you, when you graduate, you're actually kind of a step ahead because a lot of people don't figure this out until their first day on their, their first job. First year. First year, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great, I think with that, I'd like to open it up for Q&A and maybe let's take a second and thank the panel here. <laughs> Oh yeah, is there, there's one more video, I think. Yeah. The student team was really able to operate pretty independently. Just being able to watch how they work, watch how they think was a huge insight. It felt like very much a virtuous cycle of the time that we spent uh, investing in giving them feedback was only sort of repaid and amplified in their engagement as as they continue to learn and grow. I know my team and I all felt so grateful that we got to be a part of this. I myself now have a better understanding of our code base after 
um, helping a bunch of students. It really did pay off, again, tenfold for our team on how much we learned and experienced through it. Yeah, and um, uh, Kevin and I have a booth upstairs. And so if you're interested in talking with us more specifically about getting involved in mentorship for some of your companies, um, you know, uh, or, or some of your projects that you might be interested in, let us know. Sorry, I need to figure out how to get those to go to the next slide because uh, this is what I get. It it doesn't it doesn't work. <laughs> but we can we can go to Q and A while I'm yeah, trying to figure this out. On, yeah, let's go ahead and go to Q and A, and I'm happy to kind of restate the question um, with the two. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, so his question was, do you see the program as portable outside of Washington? So let me hand the uh, mic to Kevin here. Yeah, uh, Washington is our home state, but the thing is uh, we started this uh, during the pandemic, so it's all virtual. So that team was the GH uh, Browse. So if you use GH Browse, that's our four students from two years ago. So um, it's all designed to be virtual. One of the guys uh, was in... Holland, I think, one was in California. So it's by design virtual. So uh, we are going to find the right partner uh, in some other states that has the right faculty, the right uh, institutional support. Because inviting outside people into your classroom for a professor, that's not easy. It's like inviting someone into a stranger in your home for like a whole quarter, right? Uh, so. So we do, it's not frictionless. So, you know, uh, we do have to build a partnership uh, to do this long term. So we will be, uh, we we're lucky to uh, get a couple of foundations interested. And so if there are schools uh, that are like the schools that we target in other states, we're actively reaching out to them and see if they can be a partner uh, as, as we expand our footprint and try to help more students that, that, we, can, um, that we can help. Yeah, and I will say from Code Day's side, so Mint and I, uh, Mint and Code Day partner on a lot of these things. We have like very slightly different things. Mint is more of like traditional capstone. Code Day is more of these like micro internships, like one month, uh, make your first commit sort of thing. Um, so sl slightly different there, but with, with the micro internships that we've been doing, we've actually been doing those uh, in California as well. So we work with most of the um, community colleges and uh, CSUs across California, and we've had um, I think we usually we have a, between like 30 to 60 students every month doing a micro internship, um, most of them from uh, community colleges in California. So it's definitely portable. Um, we also, I think, had a couple students um, participate even internationally um, in uh, India, um, Korea, Italy, and a couple other places as well. Great, thanks. That's all another question, and then we'll come here. <laughs> yeah. uh, go ahead. Yep. Yeah, so I, I think like uh, mentors in tech and, and Code Day are, we're trying to do this as sort of an aggregator. So we have some resources that we've been putting in place to like work with the projects, try to create more, like, you know, make sure that the documentation that the students are going to need is there. Make sure that like there are issues that are either tagged uh, well enough or like, you know, we'll go out and find the specific issues that are a good fit for students. So that's something that we're trying to solve. But I've also seen some projects do this on their own as well. And I, I think like, you know, to answer your question directly, if you wanted to go to a university and, and say, hey, do you have any students working on this? Um, having a good uh, contributor guide, not just how to build the project, but how to contribute to it, how, how to, you know, if you're doing a Python package, for example, you can't just pip install it, right? You, you have to figure all that out. Do you have a development environment? Um, uh, having issues that are uh, tagged well um, and uh, being able to pick out a couple that are really self-contained, um, that are easy to identify where in the code base you would get started with it. Um, there, are, there are a lot of features like that and um, you know, we'd be happy to talk more about all of the specific features that go into it, but being able to hand them a, you know, a code base that has those features and um, you know, say here are maybe four or five good starting issues is, is probably a good place to start. Yeah, and really briefly, to, um, to underscore a little bit, I mean, Code Day Mentors in Tech, um, they're fantastic facilitators. So I work at a college, but if someone came up to me or said, they, they, I do get these kind of cold requests and emails, like, hey, I've got this project, can students work on it? I'm teaching three classes right now. There's a lot going on in my classrooms. I can't take this on right now. But having some facilitators that kind of help build that connection to help make that 
to bridge that and, and to be responsive. You know, you probably don't want to wait a week for me to answer your email. They're very responsive in the sense that they can start making the connections, figuring out the, some of the lead work, and then facilitate that connection to happen to the classroom. Yeah, yeah. And academia and industry just work at different, have a different set of vocabulary, different set of calendars. There's a lot of, that's why you don't see it's like, oh wow, academia and OS. I mean, there's a reason we're here, right? <laughs> so, so this is a reason to to figure out, okay, what can um, academia do, right? It, it there's work on Ken to get his students like Cat to work with Marianne. It's not just like there's an intro email and then we're done, right? There's a lot of little things, everyday things you have to do to, uh, to make it work. And also as a maintainer, it's not a fire and forget kind of thing, right? You shoot off a couple emails and then you're like, okay, all of the students are set, right? Like, like I said, it's your time and your energy and your investment in the student success as well as the success of the project. I saw a question in here. Oh, yeah, sorry. I just, I, sorry, I just want to add one more quick thought on that too. One of the things that we have found with the program that's been really effective is uh, actually that when maintainers tend to get super involved, sometimes that's actually a downside for the students because if you as a maintainer know the answer to every question the students have, it's actually not teaching them those skills of how to, you know, how to learn for themselves. Um, and so one of the things that we found has been very valuable is the mentors often don't know that much about the code base they're mentoring. And so we'll connect with an open source maintainer and a mentor that's never seen the code base at all. And then the mentor is kind of there demonstrating, you know, this is how we do software engineering. When I, you know, when I started a new company and I've never seen their code before, this is how I do that. And so it's actually something valuable to having that uh, separate. Yeah, it's, um, it's a Goldilocks zone. You kind of had to find, yeah, you kind of had to find that Goldilocks zone. Yeah, that, that's been my experience for uh, almost all the projects is it's been something I've onboarded to myself. And then um, I had like a, min I just, I'm, so leading the continuation of a mini internship for a project I'm a maintainer for as well, and all stellar experiences. Uh, thank you very much. Um, great talk, and uh, thank you for doing this for the for the community. And I do have a question. So, uh, speaking of the mentors, a lot of the works are now are on traceable on GitHub, and a lot of them are volunteers in our groups. Like, how do you retain them? Like, what credits are you giving them? Yeah. yeah. Are you talking about the students or for the mentors or? Yeah, the mentors. Like, how do you retain the mentors? Like, students, of course, they can learn. Like, that's the um, credits they get. Yeah. So I'll restate the question just to, so everyone can hear. Yeah, the question was, how do how do you all retain mentors yes. over time? Yeah. I, I think there's a variety of things. First of all, like, and this is true for students too. Um, GitHub allows like co-authored commits, so we actually encourage the students to to try to do co-authored commits with their other students and with the maintainer or with the mentors as well, which is just kind of like a you know it's a, a little nice thank you. Um, we'll do you know especially following up with mentors if we can and just letting them know here's what happened to your students that's very satisfying it really makes the work valuable to them i think a lot of the time um code day also like we'll send like little small thank you gifts and things like that too but i think and i i, I think kevin will echo this but i'll let him answer too like most of the mentors are doing this because you know we want to give back we want to help create the next generation of of um you know uh coders and um it's just a really good opportunity to do that. And as long as they feel like their time is being used well um, and that the students are really trying to take advantage of it, I, I think that like for Code Day, at least a lot of mentors will will mentor four or five, six projects. I mean, this is the whole reason that open source works at all, right? Like it is something that you invest in the larger community. And I think before I said, you know, PBS, viewers like you, right? This is <laughs> mentors like you. And so it is definitely, you know, I think a lot of folks uh, learn more about their, their projects. I think uh, for mentors who are earlier in their careers, it's a, it's a way for them to gain some, you know, they, they get to run a team that their company pro may not let them run, right? So you get a little bit of experience that way. And, you know, at the end of the day, you know, at the end of the day, it's what you want to do with your time that you're given here you're on earth and do you want to help other folks and this is one one way if you're a software engineer you get to um you get to do that it gives you a nice warm fuzzy feeling i don't think it's the most quantifiable thing but i think as a uh, human beings i think we all know what that feels like and also if you have any kind of conflict of interest with work and you can't do the commits yourself you can't do the, the <laughs> contributions yourself it's a great way to enable other people to do what you wish you could
And I just want to say too, as like a mentee, you know, and I'm graduating this year, I definitely plan to come back to Mint as a mentor because I've seen the value that it gives to the students. I wouldn't be where I am today without, you know, the mentorships that I've had over the last two years. Great, see so a couple more questions I see. Yeah, let's go to James in the back there, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, James has been a volunteer for a long time. Yeah. So we Thanks really for appreciate sharing, that. James. Appreciate it. Yeah, let's go here. Yeah, let me, uh, I'll repeat the question just so folks can hear. The question was, um, is there training or coaching that's offered to mentors um, to help build that kind of, or foster that kind of inclusive team environment? Um, uh, yeah, just another, uh, quickly a follow-up, why do people do this? Uh, people in industry do this. A lot of our mentors say, I wish I had this when I was in undergrad. I was like, well, I can't build you a time machine, but you can at least <laughs> alleviate the problem for current students, right? So. Um, one, uh, to answer your question, one, um, jerky people tend not to sign up for these things. You saw our boo, so if they're jerky people, they're like, oh, I want to spend more time with students. So there's like a first layer of, of like self-selection in that. And then there's an application process. There is a, uh, there's an info session. There is an interview. There is training that our mentors have to go to. So there's by the time I think they've done all of those things, I think um, they they have, uh, you know, usually proven to us that they are here for the right reasons, and we've given them the tools and the and the skill set to at least get started in working with um, with students. So yeah, we don't just airdrop and be like, oh, here's you know, draw names out of hat. Here's Ken. Here's Tyler. Okay, guys, meet each other. Okay, bye. Like uh, you know, have a great year. So so we definitely it's very intentionally structured and have a lot of support for that reason. And I would just say, um, as a mentee, we have a form that we fill out every month after we meet with our mentors, and there's a box that's not visible to our mentors, so if we did have any problems, we could bring it up there. Um, as well, you know, Kevin's very responsive to messages, so if I ever were to have a problem, I feel comfortable coming to the Mint team for that. One more thing I wanted to add to, we do, as you identified, like sometimes people feel more comfortable if you have like certain shared traits or something like that. Um, so we actually have a process at the beginning of, of all of our programs where the students get to um, basically see all of the mentors and they've written out a little bit about like them and why they want to volunteer and we'll sort of suggest mentors more highly if you have certain shared traits, like if you're both uh, veterans or, you know, you were both non-traditional students or something like that. And the students actually just get to pick, you know, sort of stack rank their their top six or more mentors and, and then we do a matching algorithm to try to match students up with the, you know, their 
most students up with the, the most top picks. So, you know, it gives students a lot of agency too in, in finding a mentor that they're going to resonate with because sometimes people aren't jerks. It's just like you just don't mesh well. I think we have time for one more question. Yeah, time for one more. Yep. Uh, go ahead. Yep. So I'll repeat the question just in case. Um, it, uh, I think the, the question was around, well, how are the projects selected? Are they chosen by faculty? Um, I don't actually choose the projects. So I'll hand it over to our partners here to kind of share on that. Yeah, Kevin and, and I are like the ones who are choosing a lot of the projects. We are, first of all, we're screening for projects that are going to be easy for students to contribute to. So again, do they have a contributing guide? Um, ideally, do they have an architecture guide? Like, do they explain how stuff fits together? Do they have a good dev environment? Is it a modern? Uh, you know, tech stack. Um, that's a big one. Um, so we're kind of picking the projects for them. Um, we try to give students some sort of guide in terms of like, when you're done with this, here's how you would pick your own project, like leave them with something so that they can do more of it if they want to. But um, honestly, I mean, I think part of it is like students don't know what they don't know. And so if you ask students to pick the projects, a lot of the time they'll pick a project that is, you know, something similar to what they've seen in class. And that oftentimes will not be as real world as, you know, again, like uh, oftentimes <laughs> our projects will be like, you know, fix a, fix a failing unit test. And like that's a very real world project that you might do in an actual job, but it's not necessarily what you would pick if you're used to like building a full stack, like MERN application from scratch. And so that like, I think there's some value to having folks from the industry, either the mentors or uh, someone like Kevin or I uh, picking out the projects, um, at least initially when the, the students don't really know. I've, I've selected projects based on uh, who I think is doing a good job um, bringing in people from all levels. And also I would like echo what was said about the stack, um, though I tend to favor Rust projects. Um, <laughs> Uh, but, you know, um, how well the contributing guide is written, um, if there's an active community already, you know, how the moderation or how the review is done, how issues are tagged, just the general health. And then uh, also if it's going to be easier for me to onboard a group onto it. So is there some explanation around what this thing does so I can grok it kind of quickly so I can do that initial kickoff meeting without having to spend hours and hours reading through everything, trying to understand how to talk about the product. Um, so kind of selling it a little bit to the imaginary facilitator or mentor. Um, and I think also like posting to newsletters. Like, so um, I'm actually one of the editors of This Week in Rust. And so I just see like everything that comes through. So I have a pretty good sense of what the Rust projects are that are really making an effort to like, you know, promote and, and get contributors. So newsletters like that or, you know, any kind of community boards. Um, I know there's quite a few websites for good first issues um, are, are really great ways to get people like myself to, you know, get visibility and select uh, the project, even though it's not my project. I think we're out of time. Uh, thank you all so much for coming. If you want to talk more, we'll be here. We also have a booth upstairs in the sponsor showcase over by the windows. And we're uh, going to be on a panel tomorrow in this exact room at 11. So we'd love to see you there too. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it.